Good evening. Thank you for uh, coming out tonight. I pray that this time that we spend in worship will truly enrich your Easter joy. Let us join in the call of worship. God said, let there be light, but we still cling to the darkness. We want darkness to cover our sins. God sent his Son into the world, not only to shed light upon our sins, but also to pay the price for them. Let us turn away from the darkness of sin, and in true repentance and humility, let us receive the light of The Lord be with you. And with us here. Let us pray. Gracious God, time and again we turn to the shadows of sin and away from the light of your love. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to turn away from the paths of darkness and cling forever to the cross on which our Savior suffered and died for our salvation. We are in no way worthy, Lord, but trusting in the loving promise of your Son. We pray that as we hear the story of his passion, we may be cleansed by the fire of repentance and made new creatures through his blood. We pray in the name of our dear Lord, your Son, who died that we might live. Amen. And from Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrow. Yet he has been strengthened, by God, and I love it. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes are we all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to their own way. And the Lord has laid on him in the name of the people of the The time of the Passover had come, and tw the twelve sat together around a long table in the upper room of a house in Jerusalem. The Master had told them over and over that this would be their last meal with each other, yet none of the disciples realized what he meant. They were too earthbound to understand. While they waited for Jesus to arrive, they began to argue once again about who was greater among them. In the middle of this squabble, the Master came into the room. Even now, Jesus must have thought, you fight over trivialities. There's so little time left. My hour is so near. I must make you understand. Instead of scolding them, Jesus took action. He laid his robe aside, poured some water into a basin, and knelt at the feet of Peter. Without saying a word, disregarding Peter's protests, Christ tenderly washed the feet of his impetuous disciple. Then he washed the feet of the others. When he had finished, Jesus put his robe back on and took his place at the table. The point had been made they were to be servants, not masters. Jesus and his disciples shared the Passover meal, the bitter herbs, the unleavened bread, and the lamb. The conversation was not unusual. Then Jesus said, He that breaks bread with me shall lift up his hands and betray me. The twelve were stunned. One of them, over and over, they asked, Is it I, Lord? They couldn't believe it. They knew the old prophecies, but still, how could one of them betray the Lord? 
Then Jesus said, He that dips his hand with me in the dish, he shall betray me. Judas, who had seen the distracted all night long, reached a piece of bread toward the bowl of lamb juices and met the master's hand at the dish. Looking up into the Lord's eyes, Judas' breath caught in his throat. That which you do, do quickly, Jesus whispered. In shock, Judas stumbled to his feet and ran out of the room. The eleven remaining disciples sat silently staring after Judas. True, he was not the most popular among them, but he had followed Jesus faithfully. Some of them even told themselves that the master had probably sent the treasurer on an errand of some kind. As they sat in confused silence, Jesus took a loaf of bread, broke it, blessed it, and gave a piece to each of them, saying, Take this bread and eat it. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Next, he poured some wine into a cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink all of it, for this is my blood which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Thus it was with the scepter of the cross looming before him that Jesus of Nazareth gave to his beloved followers, then and now, the sacrament of holy communion. As he sat in the upper room with his disciples, Jesus once again foretold his own death. Then he said, I give you a new command, that you love one another as I have loved you. Next, he told the eleven that they would be all be ashamed of him and desert him before the night is over. Peter's tan face grew red with anger. How could the master doubt his love or his courage. I will follow you no matter where you go, the stout fisherman cried, even if it is to my death. Jesus smiled. It was a bit sad, but a loving smile. Yes, Peter would follow him to death, upside down on a cross, but not until the fisherman's hair and beard were white with age. Peter, the master sighed, I say to thee that the cock will not crow until you have denied me three times. Peter and the others roared in protest, but one of them, but one look from Jesus silenced them all. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus said. You believe in God, believe in me also. In my Father's house there are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you, but I will not leave you orphans. My Father will send you are comforter, the Holy Spirit. He will be with you always. A little while later, Jesus and his disciples sang again. Then they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, 
If this cup may not pass from me unless I drink it, thy will be done. Once again, Jesus went back, only to find the disciples deep in sleep. Disappointed, the Master knelt for a third and final time to pray. Thy will, Father, and not mine, be done. Strengthened by the Spirit, the Lamb of God was ready for the sacrifice. The disciples were still sound asleep in the cool shadows of the garden. Sleep on now, the Master said softly. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners.
Judas and the others took Jesus away to Caiaphas, who had assembled the entire Sanhedrin in the middle of the night. The high priest wanted Jesus executed and buried before the Sabbath. Caiaphas wanted a fast condemnation so that so he looked all over for people to testify against Jesus, but all he could find was a handful of false witnesses. The judges of the Sanhedrin were not satisfied. They would not sentence a man to death on such shoddy evidence. There were even some among them who believed in Jesus. Caiaphas was getting desperate. The judges wanted to go home to their beds. With all the drama he could muster, the high priest stood face to face with the gentle prisoner. Jesus of Nazareth, Caiaphas thundered, I adjure you by the living God to tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. The high priest had called up the holiest oath in the Hebrew law. Jesus had to answer. Jesus looked around the room with sadness. He knew what Caiaphas was doing. He spoke out plainly. You say that I am, was his only answer. Again, Caiaphas said, By the Almighty God, I adjure you, are you the Christ? You have said, Jesus answered in calm contrast to the friend Caiaphas. For the third time, the high priest cried out, By the living God, I adjure you to tell us if you are the Son of God. The dark eyes of Jesus flashed. I am, he challenged. Caiaphas cried out and tore his fine robes. He has blasphemed. He has blasphemed. You have heard him. Now what is the judgment of the Sanhedrin? He is guilty, they cried. He must die. As Caiaphas looked on in triumph, they blindfolded Jesus, spit on him, and hit him. They mocked him, saying, Oh, anointed one, prophesy who it is who strikes you. <clears throat> In the courtyard, a large bearded man crouched over a fire for warmth, or was it to hide his face? It was Peter. He was confused and frightened, but he still followed Jesus to the judgment hall, albeit at a safe distance. I have not deserted you as you said us that I would, he thought. I am still with you. One of the servants from the high priest's household walked up to him. You were with the man from Nazareth, weren't you? She questioned. Peter turned his face away from her. I do not know what you're talking about, he grumbled. I'm sure I saw you with him, she persisted. Woman, Peter growled, I do not know this man you speak of. Leave me alone. Another woman joined in. He's one of them, all right. He's a Galilean. The way he speaks gives him away. Peter turned to them and swore. I do not know him, he thundered. The words had barely passed his lips when he remembered the words of the master. Before the cock crows, you shall deny me three times. Ashamed, the fisherman ran from the courtyard and wept bitterly.
Caiaphas and the others led Jesus to the gate of the Roman governor's palace. The prisoner's face was bruised and his robe was soiled with spit. Yet there was a regal calm about the man from Nazareth that transcended the ugliness around him. Pilate was uneasy. He'd waited all night for this visit. He'd even agreed to come out to them, since at Passover no Jew could enter the home of a Gentile. How Pilate hated this place and the, the strange religion of its people. But most of all, he hated and distrusted Caiaphas. Still, his hands were tied. One more problem, and he knew he would lose favor with Caesar. Pilate knew what Caiaphas wanted. He wanted this Jesus dead, out of the way for good. But something made the governor hesitate. Perhaps it was the serenity of the, the gentle prisoner, or perhaps it was his hatred of Caiaphas. The high priest was going on and on about blasphemy and treason, but Pilate was fascinated by the quiet strength of Jesus. Finally, Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You say it was the only answer. Suddenly, a note was thrust into Pilate's hand. It was from his wife, Claudia. Have nothing to do with this man, or I have suffered much in a dream about him, it read. Now, Pilate was even more uneasy. Claudia's dreams had been known to come true. Pilate knew, however, that Caiaphas had to be appeased, so he took Jesus into custody. Judas, who had watched the whole thing from the shadows, now burst upon the high priest. You tricked me, he cried. I have sinned because of you. I am guilty of innocent blood. What is that to me, Caiaphas, replied casually. Jesus threw the coins he'd been paid for for his part in the plot at the feet of the high priest and ran leaping into the early morning shadows. He ran until he came to a field just outside the city wall. In that field, the lost disciple hung himself from a twisted and barren tree. From that time on, the field would be known as the field of blood. Pilate still wanted to avoid killing Jesus. His hatred for Caiaphas, his wife's dream, and his growing respect for the silent prisoner made him unwilling to sentence him to death. So Pilate told the crowd that had gathered that he would have Jesus scourged. But even after he showed the bloody Christ to the crowd, they still cried, Crucify him! Against Pilate spied a way out. At that festival, festival, it was traditional to release one prisoner. Pilate gave the mob a choice. Should he set the gentle Jesus or the murderous Barabbas free? Give us Barabbas, the crowd shouted. But what shall I do with Jesus of Nazareth, Pilate asked. Crucify him, crucify him, they chanted. Would you have me crucify your king, Pilate mocked. We have no king but Caesar, crucify him, crucify him. The cry from the, the crowd got louder and louder as they chanted, crucify him. 
Pilate saw that there was nothing left to do but to let Caiaphas have his way. Jesus would have to be crucified, but Pilate would not have the guilt on his head. He called for a basin of water. Very well, the governor said. He will be crucified, but I wash my hands of it. Pilate dipped his hands into the water. This is your doing, he said, not mine. It will not be on my hand. Crucify him, the crowd screamed. Let his blood be on us and on our children. The soldiers led Jesus to a common hall, and there the whole battalion gathered to mock him. They made a crown of thorns and forced it down on his forehead. Blood streaked his face. The soldiers took his robe off of him and replaced it with a royal purple one. Then they mocked him and stabbed him, saying, Hail to thee, King of the Jews. But no matter what they did to him, Jesus remained serene. So the soldiers soon tired of their cruel game. They put his own robe back on him and led him out to be crucified. Weak and tired from the abuse he had suffered, Jesus fell several times on the way to Golgotha. The soldiers began to worry that their prisoner would die before he reached Calvary. So on the way past a group of people, they grabbed a stranger and forced him to drag the heavy cross the rest of the way. Two thieves shared Christ's fate. No greater humiliation could be visited upon a person than this. All along the way, crowds gathered mocking and spitting and thirsting for blood. But here and there, Jesus saw a familiar face, streaked with tears. Daughters of Jerusalem, Jesus cried to them, his voice trembling, We thought for me, but for yourselves and for your children. Among the weeping women, Jesus saw his mother Mary. Her eyes spoke more eloquently than all the weeping that surrounded her. She too felt the heavy weight of the cross. The mocking and spitting burned her soul. The thorns that tore into Jesus' brow ripped at her heart.
When they were done, they hoisted the cross up and dropped the foot of it into an open hole. At last, the will of Caiaphas was done. Jesus had been humiliated, beaten, and now he was hanging from a cross between two common thieves. Caiaphas had won. Or had he? If he had studied the scriptures more, he might not have been so sure of himself. Jesus surveyed with sadness the half-circle of faces that crowded around the hill of Calvary. The pain of his body was only rivaled by the pain of his heart as he looked down on the hate that surrounded him. Turning his face to the darkening sky, he cried, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus would speak six more times as he hung there in agony. Once he spoke to his mother and John as they wept at the foot of the cross. He charged them to look after one another as mother and son. In this way, he ensured that his widowed mother Mary would be taken care of in her old age. By mid-afternoon, the clouds had begun to close in, and the mood of the crowd began to change. So Caiaphas and some others came back to the scene to stir things up. He saved others. Let him save himself if he really is the Son of God, they mocked. One of the thieves who hung on either side of Jesus joined in out of desperation. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us, he cried. But the man on the other cross called back to him, Neither do you fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation. And, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. Then the thief turned to Jesus and softly said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The dark eyes of Jesus flew open. He returned. He turned to the penitent thief and smiled. Blood and sweat glistened on his face and neck, but his voice was strong. So be it, Jesus answered. I say to you that this day you shall be with me in paradise. It was dark as night now, and the clouds rolled with thunder. The only, only light was a small glow about the head of the central cross. It was then that Jesus said something that delighted Caiaphas. Loudly, the Lord cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The high priest and his friends smiled with glee. But they would have been less pleased had they recalled the 22nd Psalm, which begins with the words that Jesus had spoken and goes on to describe in detail the very things that Christ had suffered. 
Caiaphas and the others began to mock Jesus again in an attempt to stir things up. But the deepening darkness, the, the weeping of the women, and the suffering of the gentle prisoner had changed the mood of the crowd. For many, curiosity had turned to wonder and mockery to fear. Finally, the Old Testament prophecies had been fulfilled. The cup of suffering had been drained. Jesus searched the crowd for Caiaphas, then looking directly into the eyes of the high priest, he said, It is finished. Having said that, Jesus took a deep breath and spoke for the last time from the cross. He spoke as his mother had heard him speak so many times before, when he was a little boy falling asleep in her arms back home. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Then letting his head slump forward onto his chest, he released his spirit. So it was that Jesus of Nazareth died on a dark and stormy Friday afternoon. As he breathed his last, there was a loud clap of thunder and the curtain of the temple that hid the Holy of Holies from the eyes of the people was torn in two from top to bottom. It was finished. The Son of God, of his own free will, had suffered the worst death possible to pay the price for our sins. Forgive us, gentle Savior. The darkness around us mirrors the darkness within us. Carelessly, we, we turned our backs on your light. Thoughtlessly, we have closed our eyes to your love and the sacrifice you made for us.
Flood our dark souls with your light, dear Lord. Help us keep the images of your suffering and death always before us so that we will no longer stray into the darkness of sin. In true repentance, we offer ourselves to you, precious Lord. Make us truly yours. In your blessed name, we pray as you taught us. Our Father,